Church, how you doing? Pastor Mark with you. Thanks for joining us here on this very cold uh, day before Sunday. It's Saturday today when I'm filming this. So glad you've joined us. It's uh, spring here, supposedly, in western Pennsylvania. Doesn't feel like it, does it? Uh, but there's all kinds of great stuff going on to keep you warm in your heart. Uh, so I hope you uh, enjoy uh, this service and I hope you're enjoying your family, friends. Hey, I want to give you a couple things. It's a great time of the year here at the river. Uh, so first of all, I want to let you know if you're watching this uh, before March 28th, uh, 2022, you still have time to get in your donations for Ukraine uh, your monetary donations, which can be given, uh, as a check or can be given to, um, on our push pay app through Ukrainian response. Just look for that little drop down menu, Ukrainian response. Or if you're sending in a check to the church at the address, come on the screen, Ukraine response and the notes, send in your donations. We've been receiving those for the last couple of weeks. Encourage you to get that in. If you're dropping off any of the donations that we let you know that you can, that are needs like clothes and, and different supplies, you have to have that in by the 28th. You can drop that here at the church uh, and, and we will make sure that gets where it is going. You can find out what those needs are on our social media, on Facebook or in our weekly email or um, just different ways that we're getting that information out to you. Also want to let you know that coming up uh, the day before Easter, we have a really exciting egg-tacular is returning. What a great day. It's our Easter egg hunt, but we have opened it up to the community. We had about 300 people last year at this event, so I encourage you to help out with that, but also to come and invite neighbors. And that is just a part of an amazing Holy Week here at the river. Hope you'll join us for all that's going on. There is a Palm Sunday party. There's a Seder meal. There's a Good Friday service. There's Eggtacular. And then there's our Easter in the sun, our outdoor service. Hold, hold your breath. Hopefully it's warm enough. Our outdoor service and our indoor service on Easter. So really looking forward to all of that. Hope you got it down. I'm going to give you some more announcements right now. You can see, and then we'll jump in to the next week of our series called Fight Like Jesus. Can't wait. Can't wait for Easter week, for Holy Week, my favorite time of the year, and uh, encourage you to be a part of as much of that as you can. All right, roll the video. Here we go.
Hey River Church, Pastor Mark. Welcome to our online worship experience. How you doing? Sadly, I'm out here on a blustery, blustery day, spring day of about 30 degrees. Welcome, glad you're here with us. I am standing actually at a crossroads of a couple different highways, Route 51 down there, you can see, and up here, 376, that will take you to the turnpike, take you to the airport. This crossroads that I'm standing at is appropriate for where we're gonna go in our message today because we're gonna look at different roads that people take, different paths that people take uh, in our series. And we're gonna look at kind of three, couple individuals and a group of people. This is uh, week four of our series called Fight Like Jesus, How Jesus Waged Peace. And we've been looking at Holy Week and how Jesus did that during Holy Week, how he lived his life, how he fought for peace, for people to be in shalom, for people to be whole and complete, and how he did that during Holy Week. And, uh, you know, it's been quite a roller coaster. I don't know if you've joined us for these messages, but Holy Week has been somewhat of a roller coaster. It's like, oh, I can't believe that happened. Then it's like, oh, I can't believe that happened. And we've looked at Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and a lot of what seems like ups and downs that Jesus have gone, has gone through as things ramped up during Holy Week. And we've been looking at how Jesus waged peace during this time so that we can know how to wage peace when things get difficult in our lives, how we can have true peace even in the most difficult of circumstances. So that brings us to Wednesday of Holy Week. Wednesday. Wednesday when things seem to be quieting down. But you know this, if you're a parent, maybe you had little kids when, when you, uh, as a parent, maybe you had a group of little kids or a few little kids and, and you remember how loud it was? You remember even with one kid how loud it could be? But then you left them alone and then all of a sudden it got really quiet. And you knew when it was really quiet that probably they were doing something they weren't supposed to be doing. Kind of like these kids. I want you to watch this video. When these kids were left alone and it got quiet, things got kind of bad. So watch this. So you went and got a marker. Dad, we wanted to be that bad dad. So that's why we, that's why we did it. You did it for one? Because we wanted to be bad guys. And we were sorry. Are you mad at us? I mean, I'm, I'm pretty upset. Is Daddy going to be mad, too? Who knows? Who knows? Maybe we should think about what we've done. You think thinking about what you've done is going to take away the marker all over your chest? If we take a bus, it will. Maybe I will, and David will, and I get done, and Aiden will. You are officially never allowed to use a marker again. Yeah, but I'm at the draw. Well, try paper next time. Yes, ma'am. So on Wednesday, everything seems quiet, but it's not. I mean, weren't those kids amazing? But uh, during Holy Week, everything seems quiet, but it's not. A lot is happening behind the scenes. A lot of things are happening not out in the public. And one of those things is that people are choosing sides. People are choosing what direction they're going to go. They're choosing a lane. They're either all in with Jesus or they're all out or maybe even somewhere in between. They're not sure. And for all for various motives, all for different motives, all for different motives that are driving their decisions. And what we're about to look at is really going to challenge us to ask where we are at. What lane are we choosing? Where are we going with Jesus? Are we all in? Are we all out? Are we somewhere in the middle? And what are our motives? Why are we doing what we're doing? So I want to start with a couple of passages back to back. And the first 
group of people we're going to look at is a group called the Sanhedrin, which was made up of the teachers of the law and the rulers of the Jewish people. There was probably about 70 people in the Sanhedrin. And this is what it tells us about them in Mark chapter 14, verse 1 through 2. Now, these details are filled in in different books of the gospel. So I'm going to read you some uh, same story, but from different perspectives that fill in some details. In Mark 14, verse 1 through 2, it says, Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. They knew they had to do these things in secret because the people were with Jesus and they knew that the people would turn on them if they didn't do this correctly. Matthew fills in a little more detail for us in chapter 26, verse one through five. He says, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away and the son of man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or they, there may be a riot among the people. Then John fills in a little more details in chapter 11, verse 47. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. So Caiaphas, who was the high priest, he's the man in charge. He stands up and he says, look, you don't know what you're talking about. It's good that he dies. And why is it good that he dies? He wasn't thinking about Jesus dying for their sins or anything like that. Caiaphas was protecting himself and protecting the Jewish nation. He believed that Jesus would bring the Romans down on them. And that meant he would lose his security. See, Caiaphas was a master politician. In fact, the Romans who oversaw even the temple as they had subjugated the, the, the Jewish nation, the Jewish people, they actually chose who the high priest was. And they chose that person who was best at keeping the peace of the Jewish people and collecting taxes. Over the time that they actually did that, it was about 60 some years, there was a ton of high priests because they only ever lasted a couple years. But Caiaphas, Caiaphas ruled for 18 years as the high priest. Why? Because he was really good at his job. Because he was really good at doing exactly what the Romans did. They were afraid and he was afraid that they would lose their nation and lose the temple, which was the center of their security for themselves personally and for the Jewish people. So Caiaphas, he chose security, both his personal security and his national security, and he chose it at all costs, whatever it took. If it took one man dying to keep his personal security, if it took one man dying to make sure things stayed status quo, he was all in. It didn't matter what the means were, just as long as the end it was what he wanted. He justified all of his means by the end result. You know, so many people do that today in their own life. They, they justify the means based on what the end result would be. Caiaphas was, was very politically savvy, and he was very personally savvy. And he was willing to do whatever he had to do to benefit himself and to benefit the Jewish nation. And he saw Jesus as a threat to that. How off was he? How off was he? 
and he justified whatever he did. You know, I see a lot of Christians who do the same thing. They say, well, I can act this way because this is the goal I'm going for. And they do it politically, they do it relationally, they do it economically because they're like, this is my goal and that's a good goal and, and God would want that. And then they'll do whatever they can. They'll justify whatever means, they'll fight just like the world fights in order to get what they want. So here's my first point I wanna get. If you wanna fight like Jesus, Jesus fighters, people who fight like Jesus, Jesus fighters realize that the way they fight is as important as the outcome. See, the means do matter. The means matter. The means matter. You know, when I lived in Tampa, Florida, one of uh, Tampa's favorite sons or heroes is a guy named Tony Dungy. And when I lived in Florida, he had just left, or I think he left in the first year or two that I lived there. He left and went and coached the Indianapolis Colts. And if you know Tony, Tony's a strong Christian man. And Tony won the Super Bowl as the coach of the Indianapolis Colts. And I can remember Tony talking about that victory and saying, you know, my goal when I got to Indianapolis was to win a championship. Tony said how we win as as important as what we win. And he got that. He wanted to build great men. He wanted to impact his, his community in Indianapolis. He understood that the way that we do things, and he was committed to doing things the way of Jesus, was as important as winning a championship. See, Jesus' way often conflicts with our way. And Jesus' wisdom is not our wisdom or the world's wisdom. So Jesus fighters realize that the way they fight is as important as what they're fighting for. So we, we made a quick change here. The reason is because the, uh, the way we're filming, which was outside, is as important as what we're filming and we're freezing and it's so windy that we had to, we had to move inside to film this next part. So stick with us because the way we're filming, right, Megan? It's important to you. So, so I want to take you to our second person. Okay, so we looked at Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin and how they wanted to protect their security at all costs. And we're about to see a person who's exactly opposite of that. It's one of my favorite stories, actually, from Scripture. And, um, and it's, I'm so excited to even read it here and, and teach it. We don't know this person's name. It's a woman, and we don't know her name in the Scripture. So I'll just refer to her as the unnamed woman. Um, but in Mark chapter 14, this is what Mark uh, writes to us in verse 3 through 9. He says, while he was in Bethany, and so that's where Jesus retreated to often during this Holy Week, he would go back to Bethany um, where he had places to stay, to stay. And it says that while he was in Bethany reclining at the table, so that means they're eating, in the home of Simon the leper. Now, Simon, I don't think is a leper anymore. It doesn't tell us, but I'm pretty sure Jesus probably healed him. But this is uh, Simon who would have been an outcast and so you can see the kind of people that Jesus are hanging out with. Simon's probably healed now. He's no longer an outcast, but he was for we don't know how long. But Jesus is in the home of Simon the leper. And a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. And so people believe this is probably nard. And nard was incredibly expensive, maybe even worth about a year's wages. And it was basically people kept this as basically... Uh, for different reasons, for burial, uh, to anoint someone uh, precious to them when they died, or it was also security, like it was like a social security almost, like a financial security, like like um, break break in case of emergency, you know. And so that's how people viewed this uh, often. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. So you can imagine that picture. She comes in, she takes this very expensive perfume. Everybody knows what this is for. Everybody knows how important this is. But their response to their, her is interesting. It says some of those present were saying indignantly to one another. And it's very harsh in the, in the Greek, 
how they are talking to her and how talking about her. It says, so they were saying indignity to, to one another. Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Like in the Greek, it's harsh what they're saying about her. And then Jesus speaks and he says, leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you. And so Jesus is saying, look, you will always have the poor to serve. And you're supposed to do that. But right now what she is doing, this is appropriate. It says you will always have them with you. And you could help them anytime you want. But you will not always have me. I won't always be here in the flesh. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. That's a very important line. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. In memory of her, whenever the gospel is preached, whenever my word is taught, they'll talk about her. And we're doing it 2,000 years later. We're talking about her. See, she might be the first person to really see and understand what was happening. She saw and understand. Now, there were two reasons that you anointed people with, with nard. They did this to anoint a king. And so in one act, I believe that she was saying, you're my king. You're my Lord and king. I see it. I know who you are but I also understand your mission. Just as he said early, I'm going to be crucified and I'm going to die. Nobody wanted to believe that. Not his disciples. They didn't want to believe that. They didn't, they did not, they, they brushed that off every time Jesus talked about it. But I think she got it. She said, you're my king, but I'm also anointing you with, with oil that's put on, with perfume that's put on those who are about, who have died. And she is saying, I know too, you're going to die. I believe you. I believe you're going to die for me. She was the first to see it. And she was the first to act on it. She acted on it. Now, look at her life compared to Caiaphas. Caiaphas was willing to hold on to his security and his people's security at all costs. She poured out her security at all costs to her, not worrying what the cost was. She poured out everything she had. She poured out all of her security, whatever it took at all costs for him. And the result was Caiaphas is kind of a footnote in history, but she left a legacy that's now 2,000 years old. Her act of devotion has been told millions upon millions of times. So that brings us to our second point, is that Jesus fighters, people who fight like Jesus, people who fight to bring shalom like Jesus, they recognize and follow Jesus' way no matter what the cost. No matter what it costs. If it costs them even their own life, they're willing to lay it down to follow him. If they want to live for Christ, they will live for him no matter what the cost, no matter what is asked of them. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture that we get of faith and trust and where our true security comes from found in this woman. Now, we, that leads us to our next person, and he's famous. He's infamous, actually. And at the end of her story, we have a little tidbit thrown in here in Mark chapter 13 or 14, verse 10. It says, Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. So he witnesses this event, and he leaves there to betray Jesus to the chief priests. 
They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. So our next and final person today is Judas. Judas, that famous name, that infamous name. And Judas goes down as probably the greatest villain in all of history. We know him as the betrayer. But I want you to look at him today maybe a little different. Because I don't believe that Judas ever saw himself as the villain. In fact, nobody believes they're the villain in the story. Everybody believes that their way and their motives are correct. And I believe that Judas, is, Judas thought his motives were correct. I want to show you a little video that kind of portrays one theory about why Judas did what he did. And I think this hits so close to home for many of us, but it also, I think, hits close to what I believe actually happened on that day. And then we'll come back and we'll wrap up and we'll look at a little bit about Judas here in a moment. So watch this and we'll be right back. I thought he was the one. We all thought he was the one. Everyone did. There was a party and we were all, we were all there and, and some woman comes in and she has a bottle of perfume, a, a expensive perfume and she just pours it all over him. She did that because she thought he was the one. What a waste. We could have sold that perfume and used the money for a greater purpose. I tried to tell him as much. But he came back at me insinuating that he was the purpose. Even so, I believed he was the one. I believed that he was gonna turn everything upside down. I, 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 just, I just knew it. I mean, people would have followed him anywhere. All he had to do was just say the word, but he wouldn't say the word. Instead, he, my time has not yet come. That's what he would say over and over to me. My time has not yet come. Are you kidding me? He was raising people from the dead for crying out loud. He was healing the blind, producing food out of thin air. My time has not yet come. So I forced his hand. I made his time come. Things needed to push, and I was the only one that had the courage to do it. We were all up there eating. We were all up there. He looks across the table to me, and he says, get on with it. How, how did he know what I was going to do? It wasn't about the money. It was not about the money. It's just when you have that kind of power that he has, why wouldn't you leverage it to forward, to forward the agenda? People listen to him. You know the sound a wave makes after it hits the shore? And how quiet it gets after a few seconds when it stops. That was Jesus. When he spoke, it was like a, a rolling wave. And the crowd's listening. They were the hush at the end of the wave. Because when he spoke and you were there in his presence, there was no doubt in anyone's mind he was the one.
dear God. What have I done? What have I done? I love that video because it presents the view that I really hold to, that I see is what makes the most sense. So why Judas would have betrayed Jesus, not out of hate. I think he loved him. I think he loved him. I think he saw amazing things. He saw people raised from the dead. He saw blind people see. He saw lame people walk. He saw how Jesus was. He saw the love that he had for everybody. But I think Judas just had his own self-interest. That deadly flaw of self-interest and, and his desire to see Jesus be who Judas wanted Jesus to be. You know, I'm um, here in a very special place to me. This is Mount Olive Lutheran Church in Chippewa, Pennsylvania. And I came here in the summer of 1990 to be an intern at this church. It was the beginning of my ministry career. And it was here that I had to make a decision. What was most important to me? This was the first place I had to make that decision. What was most important to me? Was it following Christ and having Him lead my life? Or was it going to be a life of self-interest where I was going to try to make Jesus fit into what I wanted Him to be? This was the beginning of ministry for me, which ministry is supposed to be a life lived of uh, denying your self-interest and being there for others. And this is where it began for me. And so it's really special to be here uh, because it's special for me, but I think it has a lesson to teach is that Judas started out that way too. Judas started out that way too, where he I'm sure was trying, he wanted to do things for others, but then his own self-interest got in the way. And at some point, I think he thought, Jesus, you're not meeting my expectations. You're not meeting my expectations, but you could. I've seen what you can do. I've seen what you're capable of. And see, his own self-interest and his own expectations for God got in the way. And so that brings us to our final point for today, is that Jesus fighters make peace with the fact that Jesus won't meet all their expectations. See, Jesus fighters make peace with the fact that Jesus won't meet all of their expectations. He's not here to meet my expectations or to meet your expectations he's here to transform those see if you yield your expectations to him if you allow him to be the lord of your expectations oh what will you find you know what you'll find? And I found, I mean, these were the first days right here of me making those decisions every day, saying, Lord, lead my life. Show me what you want to show me. And it's been now 30 years later, 32 years later. And while my life, I, God's taken me on amazing adventures. What you will find if you yield your expectations to him and let him be the Lord of your expectations what you'll find is he's better than all your expectations. He's better than all of your expectations. And he will transform your expectations. He's better than all your expectations. If you're trying to fit God in your box, in what you want him to be, you will never be at peace. You will never find shalom if you try to fit him into your box. See, self-interest and wanting everything to conform to you, self-interest interest leads to schemes and to suffering. Caiaphas was willing to do whatever for his self-interest and he led him to schemes. The Pharisees led them to schemes and suffering. It led Judas to suffering. 
See, self-interest leads to those places, but surrender leads to satisfaction and to security. True security. True peace. Have you let Jesus transform your expectations? Have you let God transform your expectations? Are you still trying to get Him to meet all of yours? Because I can promise you that what you will find if you let Him be the Lord of your expectations is He will change them. He will. There, I, I don't know what else to tell you. He will change them. I never wanted to be a pastor. What, standing here, this was the first year of my life where I wanted to be a pastor. There were 19 before that where I had no desire to do that. And then he transformed my expectations. And this is the place where I spent that first year realizing that I wanted to do whatever he wanted me to do. See, Jesus teaches us that we can have peace through sacrifice, not through the sword, like Rome tried to bring peace, not through scheming and trying to get our way, like the Pharisees tried to do, or not through self-interest, like Judas tried to do, but through sacrifice, like the woman, as she broke her alabaster jar and poured the perfume on Jesus' head, she was finding true peace, true shalom. That's my prayer for you. That's my prayer for me. I want to pray right now that all of us would learn, because this is really difficult. It's really difficult to let go of your own expectations and to conform your life to God's expectations and to follow the path He has for you, not the path that you would necessarily choose for you. But I promise you that His path is always better than the one you would choose. So let me pray that way. Let me pray for us that we would, we would have the courage to surrender that to Him, to submit that to Him. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, give us the courage to surrender our expectations to you, to lay them down on the altar as a sacrifice and say, God, take all my expectations and show me what you, yours are. Show me what you want to do in my life. Show me what I really need, not what I want, but what I really, really need and what will bring me the most peace. Lord, I love you and I trust you with my expectations. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, everybody, have a great rest of your Sunday or whenever you're watching this, and we'll see you next week. Take care.